everyone. Welcome to Varsity Sports Live. I'm Kelly Stewart filling in for Tom Neiman once again. I think you've been on the show <laughs> more than Tom over the last month. A lot of I don't know. Jack's road trips for that guy. That's true. I lose track a lot, but this might be my last show. We don't know, so we're going to make it a great one. But Jandy, how's it going? You know what? We are into that time of year yes. where we're counting down the days until semifinal Friday next week. And we've got a new field, and there's some teams that I didn't think would make it this far. And there's a few teams um, that are really on a roll right now and hitting their best. And I, I can't wait to see some of these stars really explode in the next two games. Well, exactly. This is when you want to be playing your best football. Some teams peaked in the middle of the season, but some teams are some rolling teams are right really now that rolling we didn't right expect. Now. So. One of those teams, Sioux Falls, Washington. Yes, very true. They've been rolling forever, I feel like. <laughs> They had that little mid-season lull, but yes. they are fully back now. Let's take a look at some of those highlights from last night. All these quarterfinal games happened last night, except for one. We'll get to that later. This is fourth down. Rapid City Central has the ball. They hike it to no one in particular. Oh, no. Did not have anybody there to take the snap. And look at that. Adam Durland recovers and gets to be on TV. Good job, Adam. Way to go. Making special teams touchdowns. Then Tupac starts just doing his thing. Look at this. Dragon tacklers, back and forth, weaving through the Rapid City Central defense. That was a fairly long run, touch, uh, long touchdown run for Tupac. But after that, he had a lot of short touchdown runs, and Washington pretty much kept the field. They had the wind at their back. There were gusts up to 40 miles an hour at Howard Wood Field. So having that wind made a lot. Oh, there's the Gators, by the way. The Gators, the Gators, loyal fans. Loyal fans. So Tupac does it again and again, and this time Jaden Johansson tries to act like he's going to run the ball, but everybody knows Tupac gets the ball. Another thing. touchdown. They're up 21-0. Tupac again, just like a slow motion little spin, gets out of a tackle and heads for the pylon. Another touchdown for Tupac. I've started losing count literally at this point how many touchdowns he has, but that was four first quarter touchdowns for Tupac Capea and then Jack Wilson. The defensive lineman gets in on the action, punches one in. They would go up 42 to nothing just into the second quarter. Quickly got up 50 to nothing. And then after that, Rapid City Central put a few points on the board, but Sioux Falls, Washington really flexing their muscles in this one. And that is not a typo. Six touchdowns yes. for Tupac Capea. Incredible. All right. Well, moving on to our next game, we had Watertown and Roosevelt. So this is an exciting matchup, but Brennan Gabriel throws it up to Cade Cummings who comes up down with the ball the corner of the end Watch zone. Watch the celebration though. Did you see this? I didn't see it. Oh, the bowling! <laughs> I saw that on Twitter! And you can't do that in high school. You see the flag come out right at the end. Hey, but go big or go home in the playoffs, you know? You gotta. All right, then it's Nick Hookstra on fourth down and gets to the two yard line. So that's good. And then right here, Carter Lohr runs it in to tie the game at 7-7 seven seven, seven apiece. So much different than last week. These two teams played just last week, and Roosevelt destroyed them in the first half, but Watertown was in this one. You see on fourth down, they go for it. They have to get to the two-yard line, only get to about the two-and-a-half-yard line, so Roosevelt would take it deep in their own territory, and then, uh-oh, we've got a bad snap through Carter Lohr's bad legs. snap. I feel like that was a theme yesterday with the weather all around the state, but Max Sunny buries him in the end zone, and it's a 9-7 halftime lead from that safety. They were feeling really good at this point. Max Sunny was so excited. Yeah, he yelled at me right on the sideline. He was pumped up. He knows that they're winning in this game, and they were losing. Then I had to run across town, and I didn't get back, so I missed a couple touchdowns. You saw Jet Vaughn on the sideline right there. He took over. They got a pick six. They really rolled this thing in the second half. Rough Riders looked like the normal Rough Riders in the second half, getting a big win. Nick Hookster running for 101 yards. Carter Lohr almost ran for 100 yards. They finally got the offense clicking in the second half. Yeah, that's my West Side Rough Riders right there. All right, on to our next one, Jandy. Aberdeen at O'Gorman. This is the game I was at for most of the night, and really, Aberdeen dominated this game in the first half. Preston Barr set the tone, driving them deep into O'Gorman territory. They got within the 10-yard line, attempted a field goal, and you see the botch snap. They throw it up, couldn't get any points after having the ball most of the first quarter with the wind at their back, so they were a little deflated there. But this was definitely a game of defense. Caden Johnson gets a huge sack for Aberdeen Central, and again, the field position game is going toward Aberdeen. They really were playing better in this first half. 
And again, they get the ball inside the five yard line this time. Three attempts with two penalties on O'Gorman, get him down to a fourth and goal from the two. And once again, O'Gorman comes up big. So two possessions inside the 10 yard line, no points to show for it for Aberdeen Central. Very next drive, Isaac Struck finds his big man, Max Tibbetts, who just out muscles Aberdeen Central for the touchdown. And that's the first score of the game. They had to win it their back at that second quarter. And you really had to capitalize when the wind was on your back. Evan Witchery here doesn't get this the uh, clean handoff, Caden Johnson comes up with the fumble recovery. So just before halftime, Aberdeen has their third try to score inside the 10 yard line. You can see they got it. And finally, Tristan Brown comes up big, finds Landon Lundquist for the touchdown. They would leave seven to six at halftime. I had to run back out to Howard Wood Field and came Busy back <laughs> inside a minute left. And uh, O'Gorman is driving and Isaac Struck takes the keeper up the middle, gets a nice block from one of the officials, <laughs> and scores the touchdown to go up 21 to 14. One last chance for Aberdeen Central. Tristan Bound throws it up. The sophomore, Zach Norton, comes up with a huge interception to seal the game, and O'Gorman avoids the big upset with a 21-14 win. Isaac Struck had a huge day from the field. 289 passing. Passed for one touchdown, ran two more in, involved in all the scores, and we talked to Isaac Struck after the game. The weather's cold, really windy, so we had to change up a lot of stuff. Both teams obviously had to deal with it, so there's no excuses there. But hey, give all the credit to our line, and Max Tibbetts made a bunch of big plays today. Our defense held them when we needed to, and we came out and executed. We always have confidence in our offense with what we can do. We had the wind at our back. We knew it was time to strike. We had a very big, very big drive. Capped it off with a nice touchdown. It's just perfect, exactly what we wanted, executed really well, and we got it done. Well, Jandy, I think all the time basketball coaches at least talk about the unstatables, and I think that ref block was one of the unstatable <laughs> The ref block had to help a little, but Isaac Struck, he had a great game. Impressive. And let's just talk about their regular season matchup with Aberdeen. Mm -hmm. They blew out Aberdeen in the first game of the season, much closer this time around. Roosevelt handled Watertown just a week ago. You get in the playoffs with these wind and this condition that we had in South Dakota, and things just really evened out. Didn't be the case for Sioux Falls, Washington. <laughs> but Rapid City Stevens and Brandon Valley also met up in the regular season. Mm -hmm. A lot of mistakes for Rapid City Stevens. Brandon Valley won that handily. Let's see how they would do on Thursday night. All right. And this is a Rapid City Stevens game or team that, remember, we they gave them a great challenge, they Sioux did. Falls, Washington, a little bit earlier in the season, but starting off, the Brandon Valley defense was showing up big throughout the entire game. First hand in the first drive, a sack by number 36, Cade Turveer, so that was big there. And then it's Brandon Valley, they get a chance at the end zone. Number 18, Braden Peterson, we've been talking about him all the time on Midco Sports tonight, but he finds his way there. He's been racking up all sorts of running yards. I mean, 300 yards the other night. He's averaging about 200 a week right now. Uh, he had a subpar game with, I think, what, 167 in this one. Subpar. <laughs> He'd make his way to the end zone two more times before the half. They just had to feed him the rock every time. But that gives Brandon Valley the 21 to nothing lead at the half. Yeah, 169 and three touchdowns is what Braden Peterson ended up with. But uh, there it is. One more touchdown for him in the half. The offensive line has to get a lot of credit for the way they open up holes for this guy. But, man. Nobody faster than Braden Peters. Yeah, and it's a true team effort. I mean, we heard from one of the old linemen earlier. They just want to get him the ball. They want to get him those gaps so he can get the yards. But second half, Rapid City Stevens trying to get their offense going, but all Brandon Valley defense. They get the pick, the pick six by Jesse Steffel. And then coming up later, more Brandon Valley defense. I want, don't want to spoil the story here, but that was kind of the story of the game. Really, the defense stepped up for Brandon Valley, and they have been getting better and better throughout the season. And here it is, Michael Norman was subbing in at quarterback for Stevens. Kind of a deflection that time. Cole Jack Jensen picks it up and goes the other way for six. Yeah, that defense is big the whole night. And that really, I mean, in the playoffs, that's when you really need to bring it on that front because everyone's playing they have more to play for all these seniors it could be your last game you never know i feel like everyone finds a way to step up yeah rapid city stevens finally gets on the board late in that game but it was pretty much over at that point brandon valley rolls over rapid city stevens a lot of people thought this was going to be the closest game of the 11 AAA first round well aberdeen made that the closest game at o'gorman while brandon valley 
handles the Raiders. Later in the show, we'll hear from Coach Chad Garrow. All right, moving on to our next game. Harrisburg and Huron, and guess who is back from injury, Jandy? Hunter Headley, and he yes. made a difference, didn't he? He did. He's back from that collarbone injury, and he passes it to Jack Anderson for a big game. Steps right in. It's hard to do that, coming off an injury, getting used to the whole game speed, everything like that. They really did rest him enough, though. Uh, I was worried maybe they bring him back too early, but he was physical. I mean, he was pounding the ball all night, running as well as throwing. You see him get in for six right there. Um, Huron did come back. Alex Hill gets a little piece of this one and tried to keep the game close. But uh, the defense for Harrisburg made up the difference. Yeah, I feel like that was a story in a lot of games tonight. Jet McGurr throws a pick to Jackson Garns. And Harrisburg D just there the whole night. They were tight all night once again. And really through some of the lulls that they've had this season, Harrisburg's defense has been there to really sew things together. I know they've been up and down on offense all year without Hunter Headley, you know, not as good of an offensive line as they had last year. Mm -hmm. Jack Anderson's getting keyed on way more than he was last year, but the defense has been pretty steady all season long, and they showed up once again on Thursday night. Yeah, very impressive. Well, our next game, Jandy, one that was actually supposed to be played yesterday, yes, but due tonight. to weather, yeah. played tonight, Yankton at Douglas. And they were motivated, by the way, and in case you hadn't heard, the Douglas head coach had a few things to say about Yankton not playing yesterday, and Yankton came out, fired up. Big, big catch by Rex Reichen down to the one-yard line. Cade Koletsky would punch one in to get the Bucks up 7-0 early in this one. Yeah, very impressive. I mean, I feel like there's a little more off-the-field stuff going into this one with the, the weather delay, but Yankton really bringing it. Yeah, and Garrett Tennant once again looking over the middle. They, didn't, they don't throw a lot, but Rex Reichen always comes up with the football. This time he gets him down to the two-yard line, so he's not getting the touchdown credit, but Rex Reichen doing a lot of work tonight. You see Tennant to punch one in to put the Bucks up 14-0. They'd add a field goal later to go up 17-0. Yeah, impressive start for Yankton, even after you know, all the little drama. But late in the second quarter, the Patriots were finally able to put a series together. That's Trevor Severson hitting Justin Zabranek, who fights hard, gets to the 80 yard line, eight yard line, excuse me. Not the 80. Not the 80, <laughs> there isn't one. All right, late, or, uh, three plays later, Daniel Hand takes the snap and hands it off to QB Severson. They punch it in, but the Bucks would bring their power to start the third quarter. Cameron Krejci, Krejci, yeah. Krejci powering down to the four yard line on this run. And then Ray Wormers punches that one in, puts the Bucks up 23 to seven. That's earlier in the third. Taking a look at the final score, Yankton rolls 37 to 13. First road win since 2015, that's a big one. Yeah, we heard uh, Coach Lickness last week say we haven't won a road game in two years. Well, they got that monkey off their back. They're gonna have another big road game next week, traveling to Pier. But Yankton, maybe one of the hottest teams in this class right now. Yeah, playing their best football. All right, our next one, St. Thomas Moore and Del Rapids. This is a really exciting game we this had going on. Is, this is about as good as they get in October football in South Dakota. And it starts off Ryder Kirsch to Thomas Rafferty. That is a 45-yard touchdown grab. This hauls you know, it in. I don't care if you're throwing into the wind or against the wind. Even with the wind behind you, that is a tough pass to make because the ball sails a little bit. Ryder Kirsch has been right on the money and hits Thomas Rafferty once again, that time for 24 yards and a quick 14-0 lead for the St. Thomas Moore team. But then here comes Del Rapids, Matt Galugli. Two-yard touchdown run, and it's 14-7, to seven, so they're bringing it back. He's such a powerful, powerful running back. He gets him back into the game, and then a huge interception right here. Eddie Price comes up with the interception right before halftime and keeps the momentum from really snowballing. Del Rapids coming back in this game. Yeah, momentum huge in football, but then Matt Galugli, seven-yard touchdown run. It ties it up at 14-14 apiece. That's big in this one. And then look at this, a fourth down stop, and Del Rapids is fired up about this. Yeah. They take the ball over. Talk about momentum. That A fourth down stop is huge, and then it looks like a, a, a nice run to the corner this time. Alex Kringen gets the ball down to the one-yard line, and Carson Rents, yes, Carson Rents. Carson Rents, not Wentz. Not Wentz, punches it in from the one, and all of a sudden, Dell's up. But look at this, the PAT. Oh! Oh, denied. Well, that won't matter, right? They're up by no, six. No, it's fine. You got four minutes left, regroup. Let's play some defense, but look at Ryder Kirsch. He is almost out of bounds when he wails this thing. 
and he hits a big gain for Shea Casey. And then right back at, guess who? Rafferty once again, his third touchdown of the night, and they have a chance for the extra point to win the game. And they do. Joe Popple makes it 21-20. They would hold him on the next drive with just a minute plus left in the game. And the Cavaliers come across the state and beat maybe one of the hottest teams in the state in Del Rapids. Huge, huge road win for this young St. Thomas Moore Cavalier football team. Yeah, that's a big one, but not an easy one coming up. I no. mean, Dakota Valley undefeated in the regular season. They're a tough team that I feel like didn't get talked about a ton. Agreed. But they're great. And St. Thomas Moore, they have their work cut out for them there. 11A has been such a fun class. And uh, we, have, we had a rematch between T and Madison as well. This is the fourth time these two teams have played in the last two calendar years. I feel like every game we've talked about so far has started with some kind of defense and Isaac King picks off Madison on a fourth down conversion try. I mean, that's kind of the best kind of stop you can get right there. Can't hope for a better start than a 0-0 start at the end of the first quarter, but we all know how explosive this Madison team is and it usually starts with one of the Yankees. It's Jaden on this one. Yeah, I feel like Jaden and Jackson both just huge threats for that Bulldog team. Whenever you think about Madison, you think about the Yankee twins. And they were just doing their thing the whole day. Then Jackson Yankee cuts outside, turns it up the field, and now it's 14-0 in favor of the Bulldogs. So let's go with Jaden again, right? Let's go with Jaden. Let's switch it up on him. We go a little bit of each, but uh, <laughs> Jaden has been a, a great power runner this year, while Jackson has been really a terrific receiver. Almost half of Jackson's catches this year have turned into touchdowns. And uh, this time, Jackson gets the carry. So Jackson scored on a pick six in this game, a, a run and a pass. So from all angles, these Yankees are really killing it. And, and you see it with the stats here. Uh, once again, 124 yards, three touchdowns for Jaden. Jackson picks up 106 through the air on just two catches, three total touchdowns for him. And the guy we don't talk about enough probably is Josh Giles, the quarterback who just keeps this offense rolling. Yeah, the one feeding them the ball. Doing a lot. Doing the work. All right, moving on to our next one. It's Groton at Sioux Falls Christian Bob Young Field, the site for Key to the City tomorrow. Yes. But high school this week. And well, starting off, it's Parker Nelson. Who yeah. else would it be? Yeah, this guy over 200 yards once again. The Sioux Falls Christian team coming off an overtime win last week. They wanted to put this thing out of reach early, and that's what they did. Dawson Mulder gets in for the touchdown. Uh, their quarterback, Jacob Just, had a great day and on this one. He decides to keep it and run it up. Um, it wasn't even a contest in this game. This was perfect weather for a team like the Chargers. They don't mind not throwing the ball. They can just run it down your throat all game. And this guy, man, he's got to be talked about as a player of the year in this class 11B. Parker Nelson diving for the pylon, doesn't come up with it. This time he dives for the pylon and does come up with it. His second <laughs> touchdown of the night for Parker Nelson. Yeah, he's so impressive. I mean, he's won our game ball on Midco oh, Sports tonight quite a times. few times. That's but great. Yeah, Sioux Falls just rolls to the victory in this one, 48 to 14. Parker Nelson, 211 rush yards, two touchdowns, almost three, didn't quite get it on that almost one. Almost three. But very impressive nonetheless. Let's move down to some nine-man football, Kelly. All right, Avon at Howard. Oh, let's oh, Irene kidding. first. Irene Wakanda and Garretson. Blue Dragons. This is a fun team to watch. Garretson runs the ball all night long, and you see it right there, Deontay Lyman rushing it in to go up 14-0 in this one. But Irene Wakanda, they have got a guy named Trey King who pretty much changes the game. He's kind of Michael Vick-like where he can attack you with the wing, he can throw it down the field, he can run the ball. He combined for six touchdowns in this game and he has been the key to most Irene Wakanda wins this season. Yeah, here's another one of his touchdowns, right? Oh, oh, just kidding. This is the pick. That's a pick. Chris Long, Oh wait, that was that, that was that, this is Keyshawn Deer, excuse me, who goes all the way back. And Garrettson actually up 28-14 at this point, at halftime. And Irene Wakanda, they need to regroup in this game. Yeah, they definitely need to. I mean, the playoffs, you got to bring it. But look at this one. Oh, nice catch. King 12-yard pass. Brandon Sokolowski, for those of you who don't know who he is, he is a monster receiver who comes up with about six, seven, eight catches every game. Trey King loves to find Sokolowski, and this time he gets Tate Gale, who used to play quarterback on this team, gets the catch, and every, it was just on fire for this Eagles team. Once again, Brendan Sokolowski takes it, turns it upfield, nobody's gonna catch him. 
So they go up 30, yeah, they went up 36-28 in this one and polished it off. 42-28 after trailing 28-14 at halftime. The Eagles, you see it there, Trey King, such a powerful weapon in nine-man football. Yeah, 148 rush yards, 237 pass yards, six touchdowns, that's Amazing. impressive. All right, our next one, now we're doing Avon at Howard. Yes. Nine eight football doesn't get much better than this. And Gavin Erickson Reisdorfer, he can do it on both sides of the ball. That time makes a great open field tackle on Tate Winia. More defense from Howard. Yeah, Brady Cameron drops back and picked up, picked off by Mitch Kramer of Howard, and he's running it back. Wouldn't get a touchdown, but then a little bit later, Michael Hofer punches in the touchdown, and it's 27 to nothing in the fourth quarter here. He's one of those three running backs that really any one of them can explode for Howard, but Michael Hofer, usually the leader. Avon had a chance in the fourth quarter to get on the board. They get stuffed right at the goal line. Tate Winia once again, and uh, Howard, they decide to use Reisdorf for speed here, open it up on the jet sweep, and boy, Nobody's going to catch him. Yeah, he's quick up the sideline in for six, and they literally run away with it. They ran away with it. Uh, Howard showing just how good of a team they can be. Avon is no slouch, by the way, and the Tigers rolled them up at home. They have to go to Corsica Stickney next week, which I really feel that's the two top teams in this class 9A right now. It's going to be a lot of fun to see which power running team gets it done. Yeah, it'll be exciting. All right, moving on to our last game, Castlewood at Wall, home of Five Cent Coffee. Never get to Wall. This is great. <laughs> homemade donuts. Great place. Stop there once. All right, well, Wall's Trey Elshear stopped in the end zone by Castlewood's Kevin Nino. Yeah, what a play. A safety right off the bat. And then the Warriors on offense. Caleb DeCam, first a long 53-yard touchdown run. That puts the Warriors up. 9-0 right away on the road, going to Wall, a team that hasn't lost all year, and Castlewood jumps on them right away. Yeah, and you can see some snowflakes falling down, a little windy there right off of I-90, but yeah. the next Warrior series, Caden Ang takes the ball 46 oh. yards, another Warrior touchdown, and then they would also get the two-point conversion on this one, and they're up 17 to nothing. Here's the two-point conversion right here. Oh, look at the power. Powers his way in, 17 to nothing in favor of the Warriors. But the Wall Eagles weren't done. Able to throw some stout defense in there at times, but Caden Ang gets through the line, takes it all the way. 82 yards, he's gone. He really piled up the yards on this night. 253 is what he ended up running for. Five times ended up in the end zone. And Castlewood, they've been strong this year with a one little hiccup against Coleman Egan, but other than that, have been really strong. Now, Wall had to punt on their next series. Caleb DeCan, a great return, gets the ball out to midfield. And that would set one of his teammates up, a guy we've talked about a lot, Ang, for another touchdown. Don't mean to spoil the news here, but a few plays later, this is Pretty Aang. much did it every time he touched every the ball. Every time. 48 yards, that makes it 29 to nothing. But Castlewood runs away with this. Once again, I say well, run away, but well, 54 they, to nothing. Look at that. They ran for 462 yards rushing and Wall has been a really pretty good defensive team this year. Mm -hmm. Very, very impressive win for this Castlewood team. And by the way, the Wall Eagles are definitely improving. They've really turned things around in Wall, and I think that's a team that's moving their way up. But this year just gets totally stoned by a great running team that Castlewood brought on Thursday night. And Castlewood now has a rematch against Coleman Egan, which will be very tough. Yeah, it's exciting to see. Love playoffs, love this time of the year. And I think with all this weather, I mean, the snow, the wind, everything, it's just more motivation to get to the Dakota Dome for that state championship. Let's look through some of the, the uh, rest of the scores around the state that happened on Thursday night for the quarterfinals. Um, I think that's, we're gonna start in, this is a surprise, we're gonna start in Double A, where hey. Brookings and Pierre <laughs> got together. Peyton Zabel came back to play, and he played pretty well. Three touchdowns in the game, one rushing, two passing. Great night for Hudson Rohrbach as well as they roll in that game. And then Mitchell, Carson Max went for almost 100 yards. They're steadily working him back into the rotation. Drew Kitchens picked up 167 and a 41-12 win over Sturgis. 
All right, looking at our next ones, Millbank and Todd County, the 5-4 upset right here. A little bit of an upset. Todd County was without their top player who has really run over the competition, Mark Rogers. Millbank made him pay Jake Cargus, 144 and four touchdowns. And then Dakota Valley, no problem with Pine Ridge, as expected. And they did the same thing they've been doing all season long. A lot of different players like Sam Chesterman, Austin Carter, piling up the yards to beat Pine Ridge. Yeah, I was impressed by Dakota Valley when I saw them play against team. All right, our next one, Sioux Valley and Aberdeen Ron Colley. Well, Another shutout. Sioux Valley's been the team to beat. Damian Lucas, one of the best players in the state, went over 100 again. Tyler Schwartz also went over 100. And in the bottom game, Bridgewater Emory Ethan knocks out Winner. Winner has not lost a postseason game in a long time. Bridgewater Emory Ethan getting it done on the road. Man, looking at our next ones, Red Cloud. And Woonsocket, Westington Springs, Sanborn, Sanborn Central. Very good. John Witte, 148 and four touchdowns in that healthy win. And Gregory, they hung around a little bit. Wolsey Westington played a good game to hold them to 24 points, but Andy McCants runs for a 111, passes for another 108, three total touchdowns for McCants. And Jade Vanderwerf getting back into the mix after his injury. Things are starting to really come together for Gregory, but uh, Wolsey Westington, impressive performance in that loss. Yeah, McCants and Vanderwerf are just that dynamic duo, I feel like, for Gregory. All right, looking at this, Arlington Lake Preston and Miller Highmore Herald. Yeah, this will set up a rematch between Miller Highmore Herald and Gregory. That will be good. And Kimball White Lake gets a little bit of an upset over Bonham. Yeah. They matched up one time earlier this season, and it was a fairly close game, but Bonham can't get the win the second time. In fact, it was 22-14 the first time they played. This time it reverses, and Kimball Whitelake advances to the next round. Yeah, 7-2 upset. All right, Corsica Stigney, though, blanking 8 seed Denver yeah. Lake. How about that? They gained 268 yards, all of them on the ground. You know, Moki, Plamp, Menning, all, ID, all those guys killing it. Warner, no problem with Lyman. No, not much drama in this 9A class from the top two seeds. Yeah, quite a few shutouts we've had today, yes. <laughs> yesterday, this week. All right, Canastota and Canastota Freeman and Britton Heckla going at it. Three seed, six seed. Some people are a little surprised on this one. I really feel like Britton Heckla, we haven't seen the best from them yet. Preston Jones, Tayon Hawkins, both over 100 yards in that one. Um, they really shut him down in the second half to win that game. They were losing early on. And then Sully Buttes, probably don't talk about them enough either. They have been piling up the yards themselves this year. Multiple 100-yard rushers for Sully Buttes, including Mackenzie Weinheimer, 260 and three touchdowns. All right, our next one, Coleman Egan in the Fockton area, 30-14 in favor of Coleman Egan. Maybe. Yeah, Coleman Egan has a big game coming up next week, a rematch with Castlewood. Cade Gross went for three touchdowns in that one. And Cologne, see, kind of a surprise there too. Harding County was undefeated coming into this one, but the state champs, the defending champs, get it done. Cologne puts up 52. Jackson Kinzer, Leighton Teeman had that big run last year all the way to the Dome, and I feel like they're kind of hitting that stride once again. I think they are a lot, of, but I'm I'm just surprised by all the shutouts. Yeah, there. You know what? Quarterfinal rounds are not the best, but next week in the yeah. semifinals, the cream really rises. If you can get a shutout in the semifinals, now we're talking. But the quarterfinals, there are some matchups. Yeah. Eh, that High are a seed, lippy. low seed, but. All right. Nevertheless, very exciting. Right. Well, that's all for right now. But we're gonna have more on Varsity Sports Live highlights from North Dakota when we come back. Varsity Sports Live on Midco Sports Network is presented by Farmers Union Insurance Agency and South Dakota State University. We're here. All right, welcome back to Varsity Sports Live. We're That's here. what standby means, Kelly. <laughs> oh, is my we ready? To toss it to Jody. I was ready. I was just breathing. Anyways, Jody Norstead <laughs> has all the highlights from North Dakota. He's ready. He's ready to go on camera. So, Jody, what's up? How's it going? Yeah, yeah guys, we were wondering all year, when <laughs> was this West Fargo team going to slip up? And maybe it would be tonight in the state quarterfinal. In the last two years, it's been the semifinal round. Maybe, we, maybe we'd see the Packers get surprised. But... Again, they're outscoring teams by an average of 32 points per game this season. It was cold outside, but boy, the West Fargo Packers were red hot. Jason Hookstra and the Sabres trying to earn the program's first playoff win for Legacy and pull off the ultimate stunner. Unbelievable highlight here. One-handed grab from Tanner Zepeda. That was on the third play of the game from Andy Gravdahl, 28-yard touchdown. These Packers are good. First play of the ensuing drive for Legacy. Hookstra trying to beat them with a pass, and it's picked off by Darius Sua. 
Packers intercepted Hookstra twice in that first meeting. Three plays later, Andy grabbed all. This is like Johnny Manziel in his prime at Texas A&M. He flashes to the end zone for the 13-yard touchdown. It's 14-zip. Then Jared Franick caps off a six-play 44-yard drive with his 13th rushing touchdown of the season. It's 21-0. Alex Sell, the other back in this backfield. Boy, it's been Sell and Franick, Sell and Franick all year. And the rushing attack, of course, with Gravdahl too. 29 yards on that score. It's 28-0. Guys, this is still in the first quarter. Hookstra struggled in this one. He's passing again, but the pass is tipped and intercepted by Zepeda. Another outstanding play from the senior. Wes Fargo led 35-0 after one quarter. Gravdahl making it look easy on the touchdown run here. Jay Gibson, boy, he has to feel pretty lucky to have this senior quarterback right now. Wes Fargo wins big, 49-7 to advance to the semifinals. The Packers are rolling, still unbeaten. They'll play Bismarck next, but afterward, it was all about this red-hot Wes Fargo team. You know, we came out, we, we scored right away, we kept scoring, and our, de our defense did a great job stopping them. So when you can come out like, like we have throughout the past games, and especially this week, then it kind of just shuts down the team, especially when it's cold out here. You know, the team, team doesn't want to be here when, when they're losing and it's cold out. And even though it's a playoff game, you know, it st still doesn't, they don't want to be here against a hard-hitting team like us. So as I mentioned, the Packers will host Bismarck in the semifinals next week after the Demons were able to tame the Bruins of Fargo South the second time this year. The first meeting was a 41-14 Bismarck victory. Tonight was different. Bad start for the Bruins. Jamin Howard gathers the opening kickoff, and as he approaches the first wave of Demons, the ball is jarred loose. Huge momentum swing. Jalen Sprecker finds the end zone three plays later. The home crowd with plenty to cheer about. But the visitors bounce back with a 17-play, 95-yard drive. Victor Isaac caps it off. With his seventh rushing touchdown, Bruins tied at seven. Bruins on the drive again, but Du Bois gets hit. Isaiah Olsen camping out underneath for the interception. Sell turned the ball over six times, and the Demons were capitalizing all night. Will Mather to Joe Johnner for the 24-yard score. Demons in front 14-7. That was the score at the break, so it was close. Third quarter, Isaiah Olsen takes over for Sprecher, who is injured. He rushes in for another Demon touchdown to make it 21-7. As I mentioned, turnovers were the story. Another pass, another pick. This is Johnner, who already had that touchdown catch. Then Olsen scores on the ground again. His third of the game pushes the lead to 28-7. Bismarck wins in a rout, 42-15. The Demons rush for 200 yards and roll their way into the semifinal round for a second consecutive season. Feels pretty good to win. Uh, we came back from our loss against Century, which kind of hit us hard. Then we went to Dickinson and we won, but it feels good to be on the winning streak again. I thought turnovers were huge, and that was, you know, with a team like South, it's, they've got a lot of weapons. You know, we uh, we bent, but we didn't break, and we had some, uh, you know, we our kids made some plays, and we just tell them to just hang in there, and that's kind of what they did. And uh, you know, it's a good football team, and I thought we played extremely well in the second half, and uh, we're happy to be moving on. The two-time defending state champs from Bismarck Century welcoming Fargo Davies to town with a trip to the semifinal round on the line. Century scores first. Quarterback Jacob Olson hops in for the score. Davies comes back with a nice run by Isaac Fanai and a shoelace-saving tackle here by Levi Rocky chasing him down. Man, Fanai, very quick though, but it doesn't matter. Nick Chosick is going to score here on the pass from Jesse Forknell. Chosick had the big game earlier this season. Had 234 receiving yards against Century in that regular season loss. He came up big again in this one. Johnson Jones, the star of the next drive, though. First a long run, and then he scores. Makes it 14-7 Davies. The Eagles smell an upset. Century threatening to score in the final seconds of the first half. Watch the one-handed grab. This is the theme of the night. Ty Satter with the touchdown saving pick. A huge play. Eagles lead going into the locker room. In the third, Jesse Forknell, Mr. Forknell to his favorite tar target. You guessed it, Chosick in stride for a 65-yard strike. 21-7 Davies. Are you kidding me? The two-time defending champs are on the ropes, but Century rallies. Olsen scores on the ground, and then Casey Foss rips off this long run. Down to the three-yard line, dragging defenders with him. He'd score on the next play, tying the game early in the fourth. After a couple of big defensive stands, Century has it with 1.21 left. Olsen is going to scramble here, not finding anything downfield, so he does it with his legs, putting the defenders on the spin cycle. He gets down to the 25. Century decides to run down the clock and attempt a 37-yard field goal. 
His teammates can't bear to watch it, but Austin Underhill, the junior kicker with the biggest kick of his life, here he comes, 37 yards, and you guessed it, he drills it. Century comes from behind to avoid the upset and win it 24-21. Olsen in disbelief. Great work by our camera crew. The two-time defending champs are going to the semifinals in dramatic fashion. I think the biggest thing for our team is we just kept believing in ourselves. Um, mistake after mistake, uh, we were just able to bounce back after all of them. Um, my, teammates, my teammates really helped me out tonight. Uh, the defensive side of the ball really stepped up in the second half, and that was huge for us. One more spot for the final four. Cheyenne, the two seed in the East, hosting Minot, the Magicians in the playoffs for a 21st consecutive season. Things got underway quick. Minot takes the opening drive 80 yards, capped off by Dylan Danielson, plunge it in, seven rip Minot. After a fourth and one stop on Cheyenne's 18, the Magicians get the ball back. First play from scrimmage, Creighton Rudolph to Lofton Clavundi for six. After the conversion, it's 15-0 Minot. Back come the Mustangs. On their ensuing drive, Parker Sander keeps it and takes it 63 yards. You ever try to catch a Mustang? Good luck. The score now 15-6. There was plenty of scoring early and often as you see 5-12 still on the clock in the first quarter there. Still in the first. This time it's Nathan Goldaddy from 10 yards out. All of a sudden Cheyenne back within three at 15-12. You guys, there was a ton of offense in this game. Over 700 combined yards in the first half. Here's 59 of them on fourth and four. It's Sander to Goldaddy. Magicians lead cut to 22-19. With nine minutes left in the first half, Brett Davis punches it in from three yards out. Minot leads 28-19. Here's where you got the sense Minot was pulling away. With five minutes left in the first half, Peyton Lamore takes the end around and reaches out, but is down just at the one yard line. That sets up this QB sneak by Rudolph, makes it 35-19 in favor of the Magicians. Minot up 42-25 at the half. After a few more touchdowns, Cheyenne tries to cut it to a two-possession game early in the fourth, but the big man, Logan Kruger, drops into coverage. Are you kidding me? We're going to see a big man touchdown? You bet. 80 yards. He seals this one. Minot wins it 66-37. Highlight of the night belongs to Kruger. They move on to play the two-time defending state champs from Bismarck Century who barely squeaked by Fargo Davies. You know, it's it could be my last game ever in high school, and I just I didn't want that to happen. I knew I had to play as hard as I could, do the best I could, and everything worked out tonight. So Minot has not lost in the quarterfinal round since 2012. Now the Magicians with a little bit of magic at Cheyenne and plenty of points, guys. 60-plus for the Magicians tonight. And now they'll take a crack at that Century team, who we all thought was the odds-on favorite out West, but they, they struggled with Davies, yeah. and now they're going to get Minot. Semifinal week is going to be truly awesome, especially in AAA. Can't wait. It is, and we'll have more coverage, of course, of the big games coming up tomorrow here in a little bit. All right, looking forward to it. Thanks, Jody. Well, when we come back, some zone coverage here from these coaches in their first round of playoffs. A lot of exciting stuff. See what they had to say. Varsity Sports Live on Midco Sports Network is presented by Farmers Union Insurance Agency and South Dakota State University. All right, welcome back to Varsity Sports Live. It's time for zone coverage. And first, we're going to head up to North Dakota with Jody Norstead. Jody. Yeah, guys, we just saw that those highlights of the West Fargo win, that 49-7 victory for the Packers, who looked absolutely dominant in that first play that we showed. You remember that, that Tanner Zepeda one-handed touchdown catch? We're going to get another look at it. It really impressed the head coach of the Packers, Jay Gibson. We really played well offensively. Uh, a number of receivers caught passes. Um, Zepeda had a really nice, hopefully you have that on, on film because he made a real nice one-hander. The 6'6 guy was uh, trying to swat at it, and, and I think Zepeda's about 5'6", but it doesn't matter because he caught it. Uh, really tr tremendous play, and then the defense just kept it up, and I think they had another turnover before the first half. How about that honesty from Jay Gibson? Uh, wow, what a catch. And uh, you can't say enough good things about Tanner Zepeda. He's been absolutely awesome this year, as have a lot of those Packer players. How about Bismarck Century, the 24-21 win? The come-from-behind win against Davies when they trailed 21-7 at one point in the third quarter. But they get the 37-yard field goal, the walk-off winner from Austin Underhill. Head coach Ron Wingenbach, pretty pumped up about that. 
In practice every Thursday, we go through that same scenario of bringing him on off the sideline as the time's winding down. And I'm sure there were some butterflies in his stomach, but uh, I tell you what, all three components, the snap, the hold, the kick, uh, were very good. And I thought our offensive line did a great job. So next week in the semifinals, Century hosts Minot, West Fargo hosts Bismarck. But what about all the games going on tomorrow in Class 2A, Single A, and 9-man? Here's a breakdown that we had earlier in the week on Midco Sports Tonight with Brad Anderson and Chase Miller of 740 The Fan. In 2A, Chamois and St. Mary's have the week off. What's the more intriguing matchup then? Watford City at Jamestown or Wapaton at Devil's Lake, Brad? Probably Devils Lake and Wapiton, I yeah. think, just because you know, the six overtime game was just one of, of legends, so to speak, <laughs> down at uh, down in Wap. But you know, can they do that again? You know, is Dikey can Dikey be a big factor? He's going to have to be for them to win. So I, I think that one intrigues me more. And I take a look at the Jamestown Wofford City game. I think that one's going to be a little bit better because of how Wofford City is currently playing. They yeah. lost their first three games all against quality competition, but then you won six straight, beat Wapiton, you beat Bismarck St. Mary's. They're going to be looking for a little revenge factor too, going to Jamestown, getting blown out, as Brad said. And it's the first time for the Blue Jays that they've had a home playoff game since 1994. So that town, that crowd, they're going to be geared up for it. I think Wofford City and the Jamestown game is going to be a little bit more of an intriguing matchup than Wapiton well, goes like. I think what gets lost in all this, Shanley's the number one seed. They play the winner of Jamestown in Watford City. Those two teams play in as well as anybody right now because, as you mentioned, Watford City's won six in a row. Jamestown has lost three games by a combined 15 points to those teams that are one, two, and three. That's going to be a lot of fun in Class 2A. In Class A, the game we thought would be the closest was Carrington against Oak Grove. It was as good as advertised. Cardinals win it by six points, meaning all of the home teams won. Which quarterfinal, though, has you most intrigued because there's some really good matchups, Chase? You know, I would have said Delax Burlington because we talked about him last week on the mm -hmm. show. I said, don't overlook the Lakers. However, their senior running back got injured in their game against Kildeer. He's out for the rest of the year. Ooh. They had three turnovers against Kildeer that they were mm -hmm. able to overcome. You're not going to be able to do that against Dickinson Trinity. I like Velva, and I like going up against Beulah. I think that's going to be a ground-and-pound game. Beulah, they run a different offense yeah. that you don't see every day with head coach Jim Dooley. They had over 300 rushing yards in their opening round win uh, going up against Bishop Ryan. I think Beulah and Velva is going to be about a one-point, I mean a one-position game. Yeah, I can see that. It could be in like a 14-12 type of game. I'm going to go EEK and, uh, and Langdon. Langdon. I, I just think that's... That's got the potential to be a shootout. You know, we talked about the weapons that Langdon has last week, and some of that was on display, although Kendra did a good job, I think, uh, you know, shutting them down at times. EEK, boy, Green Ike had a big game, and I think it, that's going to have to be the case again. He might have to go for 200 or more and, and see if he can carry him, carry him into uh, – to the to the next round like he did last year when they, they beat him to go to the excuse me to the Dakota Bowl. Yeah, and that's that's what kind of makes this a little bit more flavorful, right? Mm -hmm. EEK had to beat Langdon Edmore Munich last year. Now I don't know. I, Langdon Edmore Munich, you could argue is the favorite in this matchup, but you got to get it done against the defending state champs. Nine man, I give Chase credit. He brought it up last <laughs> week. The Mayport CG is his Cinderella story, and Cinderella is still having a ball, right? After beating Nelson County 38-8. to eight. The Patriots are the four seed from Region 1, but now the Patriots have to play the top team in that region, undefeated Weimar Lidgerwood in the quarters. I know you're calling this game, Chase. Did the Patriots have a shot against the Warbirds? I think you got to say yes, and if I'm Mayport CG, I say put all the pressure on Weimar Lidgerwood. They're the number one team from your region. They're the number one team in state. No one would have thought that you would probably make the quarterfinals except for the coaches and the players probably <laughs> yeah. on that team. If you can go down to Weimar Lidgerwood and come up with an early lead, I think that's always a big thing in pulling upsets. Come away with an early lead. You know, they have Harless, uh, Vasquez, they have Furch. I mean, Weimar Lidgerwood just has weapons all over the board. But can you pick them off if they play one of their worst games of the season? If Mayport CJ can play their best, they have a shot. But I think the Warbirds get the job done. What's your final four in nine, man, guys, as far as what's going to happen in these other three games? Well, I think I like Shiloh at home. It's hard not to, mm -hmm. you know, it's hard not to pick against them at home. Uh, the one in North Prairie and New Salem, Glen Ullen. I mean, that North Prairie game, my goodness, 64-62. <laughs> Over Mount Region. Yeah, I had a ton of points like that. I think I, that to me is really intriguing to see if they can go to New Salem and pull off the upset. And I think the other thing as well, my upset pick was just short last week with Hankinson against uh, Napoleon Gackle Streeter, but... Uh, you take a look, Napoleon had two guys over 150 yards on the ground. They maybe match up a little better with Cavalier than maybe Thompson did last week, but I still like I still like Cavalier just the way that uh, Erlop's playing at quarterback. He was 
He was dominant in that first half. I was going to say, how bold are you going to be? Are you going to say the Napoleon's going to win it? <laughs> Not that bold, but I, I, I think they, they might surprise him. I, I think it might be a tighter game than people expect. If Nathan Weigel, he has 19 touchdowns on the ground, over 1,500 yards rushing for Napoleon Gackle Streeter. We mentioned Green Ike with EEK. If he can have a really good game, they could maybe force Cavalier into some stuff that they haven't been as much challenged because Thompson they've beaten twice. I think Napoleon will make it close, but Cavalier gets the win. I like Weimer, and that would be a great semifinal matchup, too. Teams yeah. have been one and two the entire way. On the western side, I think we're going to see a rematch with New Salem Glen Allen again going up against Shiloh Christian. Shiloh Christian is, I think, too tough in the playoffs to, for Beach to go there and win. And that was a fun game in the regular season, wasn't it? It was. It was one of those games where you can't predict, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And guys, you can find all of our predictions on MidcoSN.com. Just click on my blog. It'll be a fun day tomorrow. It certainly will. Thanks, Jody. Well, coming up after the break, we have zone coverage really quick. A top play from each of our games. Stay tuned. Just kidding. It's the rundown. All right, welcome back to Varsity Sports Live. It's time for the rundown, not zone coverage, yes. which I said before the break. The rundown, a top play from each of our games, Jandy. I love and this part. As, as you know, exactly. We get the best stuff all in one, or well, not one minute, about two and a half minutes. Two and a half. But let's Give get right time. into the rundown where Tupac Apea, I think, is still running with the win behind him. Six touchdowns, dominant win for the Washington Warriors. And then a last minute touchdown run by Isaac Strzok, who rolls in and beats Aberdeen Central 21-14. Once again, the favored seed number three, Brandon Valley gets it done on their home field. Three touchdowns for Braden Peterson as they take a 35-17 victory. And at Howard Wood Field, down at halftime, 9-7, the Rough Riders come back and get a 30-16 win. Harrisburg gets their quarterback back, Head Hunter Headley. He finally had back. a great night, exactly. Finally back. He's been over a month out, and he came back, made a big impact with three touchdowns. Yankton showed up in Box Elder and got it done. 37-13, no problem for the Bucks. Their second big win in a row, and they're rolling in 11-AA. Have Pier next week. Speaking of rolling, Madison, the Yankee Twins, both go for three touchdowns. No problem, 43 points for them. And Del Rapids, St. Thomas Moore, maybe the best game of the quarterfinals in South Dakota. St. Thomas Moore let a lead escape, but got it back in the last couple minutes of that game to get a 21-20 win. Sioux Falls Christian, no problem with Groton area, 48-14. In 9A, Avon took on Howard, and Howard played some really good defense. Michael Hofer punches one in right there. 34-0 win over a very good Avon Pirate team. And Irene Wakanda, a huge second half for Trey King and Brendan Sokolowski. They came back from a deficit, 28-14, and get a 42-28 victory to go to the next round. And Castlewood took the trip across the state to play against Wall. Well, Mr. Eng had 250-plus yards, five touchdowns, and the Warriors rolled. In North Dakota, the AAA quarterfinals, West Fargo, once again, no problem. Andy Gravdahl gets in for 49-7 victory. At the bowl, the early game, Bismarck takes a 42-15 win over Fargo South. And that was just the prelude to what was the best moment of the night in my mind. Austin Underhill, 37-yard field goal to win the game. He can't bear to look. Look at that. Jacob Olson, happy to get the win. And then Minot took on West Fargo Cheyenne. Minot has been absolutely outstanding in postseason over the last couple of years, especially in this quarterfinal round. They roll, and uh, it's going to be a fun semifinal week next week. I can't wait for Varsity Sports next week already. <laughs> it's going to be outstanding. And maybe is Tom on the road or am I here? Tom is says he's back. Tom is here. For but you are on the road tomorrow to Vermilion yes. for a little football. Southern Illinois at USD. That's a big game. The Yotes coming off of a loss, so that'll be a big game. But talking about high school sports, yeah. Andy, we can't jump that far ahead. But um, the quarterfinal round. I mean, we had a few good games. We had some upsets. But like you said earlier. Quarterfinals are pretty good, but the yeah. semifinals is where it really gets exciting. This is where it gets exciting. This is where teams like West Fargo have tripped up over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. We thought they had really good teams. We've seen Roosevelt trip up in this mm -hmm. round a couple of years in a row now. It's going to be great to see them go up against Brandon Valley. That's become quite a rivalry. Can't wait. Oh, we'll try to get to as many games as we can <laughs> and wrap it all up next Friday. All right, well, looking forward to it. We'll have more Varsity Sports on Midco Sports tonight next week. Thanks for watching, and we will see you next week.